Right, time to return to politics now. I'm joined live out of Canberra by Liberal Senator James Patterson. Thanks very much for your company. Always a pleasure, Peter. Now, I know your side of politics, uh, you know, the culture wars is, is, is part of what's going on around 18C. You're sick of the kind of PC attitude of the Greens, save the sperm whale, worry about the Great Barrier Reef and climate change and all the rest of it. But let's park that to one side. I, I have a sympathy, a natural sympathy for the desire uh, to see free speech reign. Uh, more than you might imagine, actually. Good. But put that to, I'm pleased to hear that. Let me put that right in the thick of this. The issue, though, for me, is what about the changes to 18C uh, would have changed cases before now? Because the QUT case, a disgrace. The Bill Leake case, a disgrace. Uh, but opponents of change to 18C make the point, which I think is right, that those cases wouldn't have proceeded with the procedural changes that have been recommended for the Human Rights Commission. What specifically would have changed in, in those cases or others uh, had 18C been amended in the way that the government now wants it to be? Uh, it's a really great question, Peter, and actually this is the heart of the issue and why I believe both the procedural changes and the legal changes need to proceed. Now, had these procedural changes been in place, there's no question that the QUT case, for example, would have been more quickly uh, resolved. It wouldn't have sat in the Human Rights Commission for 14 months, for example, because we put a time limit on it. And the students in the case would have known about the case from the beginning, so they would have been better able to defend themselves. So that would have been preferable. But there's nothing that would have stopped uh, the applicant in, this, in the QUT case from taking the matter to court. And we know from what, how she behaved in the actual court case that she was a very determined litigant and she would have taken this to court anyway as she did in this case. I mean, even after she lost resoundingly and had enormous costs awarded against her in the initial case, she still then sought leave to appeal to the Federal Circuit Court. So it's important that the law is changed as well so that those students in that case would feel confident that they'd be able to adequately defend themselves if, they were, if another case like that was brought well, against them. Oh. And absolutely crucially, Peter, just finally here, really quickly, mm. those three students who paid the $5,000 each to be removed from the case, they might not have felt the need to do so if they'd felt that the law was on their side and they had a good chance of defending themselves. But having said that, though, even Tony Morris, the QC that was defending the QUT students, he says, he said it in an op-ed in The Australian that I write for as well, and he's said it post the case as well. I think he said it uh, at that Bill Leake function uh, before he passed, tragically, that had the procedural changes been in place uh, in time for the QUT case, that would have been enough to stop it dead. Uh, so, again, my question is, it, it doesn't sound like anything beyond those procedural changes would be necessary to deal with the QUT case. What about, uh, is it something else? Like, so what I, I guess what I'm driving at, Senator, is, you know, the Andrew Bolt case, I'm not sure whether that would have been changed. It certainly, I don't think, would have changed because of these procedural changes. Is that a case that the change that your side of politics are recommending to 18C might have changed? Well, we'll come to that in a minute, but um, just to be clear, you, you are not correctly stating Tony Morris's views, and I can say that with great confidence because I had an email with Tony about the proposed changes last night. Um, oh, he's in, <coughs> I know he's me. in favour, let me say, I, and his I, view, I, I, know, I know he's in favour of changing 18C, uh, he's on the record about that, but he did also make the point, both in that op-ed as well as what he said uh, at that event, uh, that what happened to the QUT students would not have happened had it been uh, for the procedural changes were they in effect. No, that's, I'm sorry, Peter, that's, that's not Tony's view. Tony's view is the same as mine, that it would have been um, a, a less painful process for the students, but not that it would never have got to court. Um, and it's very clear that it would have still got to court because there's nothing that would have stopped the applicant from taking it to court from the procedural changes. So, yes, it would have been a less painful experience for the students, um, but at the end of the day, they still would have had to defend themselves in court if this law was not changed. OK, so, so, so can, um, on, on that, because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, if you like, uh, challenging you on that, I'm, I'm interested in clarifying mm. on that. Uh, which goes back to my premise that I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a zealot opponent of what the government is, is proposing, far from it. So let, let's just workshop this if we can. So under the procedural elements only, uh, what mm. would have happened then uh, in the QUT case to the extent that we can crystal ball gaze? Uh, are you saying right. that uh, despite those procedural changes, there still would have been capacity, would there, for the, for the uh, person taking action to have said procedural changes or not, I'm insisting on my day yep. in court. Is that your point? 
Well, yeah, that's right. And it's worth stepping through what the procedural changes are and what effects they Please, would have had. Yeah. So the first one is a complaint would need to be made within six months as opposed to currently within 12 months. So um, in this case, the applicant did wait for the full 12 months before making but, the complaint. Yeah, but, so but that, that would but, have been but, shortened but by they, six months. But I agree with you, they wouldn't have. They would have just acted more quickly. So I, I don't think that procedural Correct. change would have made Correct. any difference. Yep, OK. So that's number one. Number two is the Human Rights Commission would have been required to notify all the applicants in the case. That's good. The students would have known about it. Number three, the Commission would have had a, a time limit, although it's not a firm time limit, it's an indicative time limit, of 12 months to investigate and conciliate the case. Um, they took 14 months to do with it. So best case scenario, that would have reduced it by two months. Uh, another change is that if the Commission decides to terminate a case, then the, applic the applicant would have to seek leave from a court um, to, to continue the case. Now, um, the applicant did seek leave um, from a court to continue the case in the appeal, so we know that she would have done that. Um, well, okay, can, 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 that I, can I stop you on that one? Because that, that's just one where I want to yeah. ask some questions. So there's, there's sure. a big difference between this lengthy, drawn-out process uh, through the courts, which ultimately found in favour of the students, isn't there, and the, relatively speaking, much shorter process, which was the appeal, uh, where she withdrew from. Is it only the shorter process under the procedural changes that would have continued, or is it both? Well, I mean, it, for the students, it was the cumulative effect of the Commission taking a long time, the courts taking a long time, there being an appeal. So it was a combination of all those things is why it added up to almost four years, which is an extraordinary length of time to yep, have agreed. a matter like this resolved, particularly, particularly such a trivial matter. Um, now, the other thing, though, is, is coming to this point about termination, um, Peter, is that... Uh, the Human Rights Commission already has the power to terminate vexatious complaints. We're going to make that power a little bit wider. I think that's a good change. But Gillian Triggs has said that she believed that the QUT case had, quote, a level of substance. So I am unconvinced that no matter what power we give Gillian Triggs or any other Human Rights Commission president like her, that they will never terminate a case like the QUT case if they have the view that it has a level of substance. So um, ultimately, the, the process changes alone certainly would make things better and are worthy in okay. their own right, but ultimately are not going to be enough. OK, well, that last point, I think, is, uh, you know, uh, with respect to your strongest point, <laughs> uh, because uh, that, that, as soon as I hear it, that resonates uh, as, as a reason why you therefore need to do something more. We'll get to the Andrew Bolt case in a moment. Let me ask you, though, how does that something more prevent the same process happening anyway? So, in other words, the changes that have been made or proposed to be made to 18C, how would they avoid, if you like, if I could put it this way, what, what, what might be deemed vexatious litigants uh, and a Human mm. Rights Commission that errs on the side of caution, maybe that's the wrong word, but mm. the side of caution of actually doing their job uh, and waves it through so it becomes a court problem rather than their problem, wouldn't that still happen uh, under a changed test of 18C anyway? Well, you're right, Peter. It's not a guarantee that there'll never be another QUT case. The only guarantee there'll never be another QUT case is to repeal the law entirely. And as you know, there is no prospect of that happening. Yep. So um, that's why I've called this a compromise measure, and I think it is a compromise measure. It doesn't guarantee it. But it will substantially reduce the risk, because um, if you're an applicant considering this new law, where the balance has been shifted to better protect free speech, you will know your prospects in court are not as strong as they once were. And if you're a potential respondent in one of these cases, you'll be more confident that if it does get to this, that you'll have a good chance of defending yourself in, in the court. So particularly for those three students who paid the $5,000 each, um, they're very unlikely to feel the need to do that if they're accused again, if the conduct is as um, trivial as it was in this mm. case, because they'll be confident that they'll have a good case to defend themselves. They'll be confident that they haven't harassed or intimidated anyone, and they'll be confident that with an objective community standards test, rather than the relatively subjective reasonable, per reasonable person test we have at the moment, that they'll be able to defend mm. themselves adequately. OK, let's get to the Andrew Bolt case. One of the things that when people have been proposing changes that have not involved uh, changes to 18C to the extent of what has been proposed through the Liberal Party room yesterday, the Joint Party room, uh, I, I have been critical of uh, people that have, uh, if you like, uh, railed against the Andrew Bolt decision but then proposed measures that won't do anything to adjust what happened to my colleague here at Sky News, Andrew Bolt. Uh, would this change to 18C have seen his case uh, less likely or unlikely uh, or guaranteed unlikely to have gone the way that it did? 
It's not clear, Peter. Um, the judge found in the case that um, Andrew Bolt's article had offended, insulted and humiliated and intimidated the people, the applicants in the but case. But it's accumulative, so, though, isn't it? So if you don't have the other three, do you get to the, to the last one, which is uh, you know, the higher bar of intimidate? If, if, you, if, you've, if you've got harass and then intimidate rather than all the others, uh, do we know? I mean, what, what, what's, the, what's the professional opinion on that? But what we can't say with confidence, my view though, Peter, would be that it's less likely um, that a newspaper article such as Andrew Bolt's or a journalist like Andrew Bolt writing on a similar issue would be caught by this law. Certainly, if they were to be caught, it would have to be very serious um, and egregious conduct to be caught by this new law. So um, my, my, think, my view is that this is, a, this is a better balance. It's not that nothing would be caught by this law, or certainly many things would be caught by this law, but, but lower end conduct that is expression of opinion in a, in a newspaper article is much less likely to be caught. OK, and is it your view, I mean, we've got to be careful that we don't reflect on the bench here, but is it your view uh, that had the, the Bolt case been appealed to a higher court that there is a fair or a good chance that it might have been overturned? And, and I guess as part of that question, were it to have gone the way that it did in that court, but with the newly framed 18C, a lot of crystal ball gazing here, Senator, my apologies, uh, is it mm, your sure. view that that would have made it even more likely that had it been appealed it would have been tossed out at some point? Well, actually, we examined this issue during the parliamentary inquiry and we had Justin Quill, who was Andrew Bolt's lawyer, before the committee and we asked him, why didn't you appeal? Um, and he said it was Andrew Bolt's decision and the reason for his decision was that at a time when his um, employer was sacking journalists, um, he didn't want to be personally responsible for incurring even more costs in this case and risk that even more of his colleagues would be let go. So that was a very honourable decision by Andrew Bolt, but obviously it didn't allow us to really test whether this law, mm. um, particularly whether it is a constitutional law, We've heard evidence during the inquiry. Um, there's certainly a range of views on this. Some people think it is constitutional, but many legal academics think that if this was taken all the way to the High Court and its constitutional validity was tested, it may fall down, particularly okay. because of the threshold of offence and insult. Before we run out of time, I mean, is it your view, your considered view, that uh, what has been proposed, I know you've said it's a compromise, it's not going the whole hog, if I could put it that way. Is it your view that it's really good enough, though, uh, for your party in terms of your philosophy and your beliefs and your views? I ask that because I'm sure you were probably at the IPA dinner where Tony Abbott announced, uh, with much fanfare at the time, uh, in front of some substantial figures, that he would abolish 18C so that what happened to Andrew Bolt wouldn't happen to any other journalists ever again. Uh, and it sounds like what's been proposed, as you say, it's a compromise, but it, it gives no guarantees that what happened to Andrew wouldn't happen again. Ultimately, Peter, this is a choice between something which I think is um, relatively achievable, there's certainly it's no guarantee that this package will pass, and something which um, might be more pure but is definitely unachievable, and that would be a full repeal. Um, now, I'm, I think we should take what is available and on the table, which would substantially reduce of these further risks Xenophon's of QT gonna block and it, though. cases. Xenophon's going to block it, though, Senator. So not only is what is on the table less than what you or others might deem desirable, the, the full abolition, but what you'll probably only get through the Senate is only the procedural changes that you just very convincingly proved to me is not enough of itself. Uh, that's not going to be good enough, is it? Well, Peter, we've, we've barely begun the negotiation process. I'm not willing to count out... Um, well, Zedafon's already said he won't. And their votes on... he's, he's said he's done well, and dusted he's... with this. He's certainly said he won't vote for what the government has proposed, um, but I'd be very interested to know whether they have any amendments that they'd propose to make it um, more acceptable to them, whether there's a ver any version of this that they're willing to vote for. Um, I certainly understand and respect that they don't agree with what the government has proposed, but that doesn't um, remove the possibility that they'd be willing to vote for something else. So um, we're at the beginning of this process in terms of the Senate. Um, it will have a little bit to run yet and there'll be negotiations to happen, and I'm hopeful that they'll consider seriously these, the merits of this. Because if they don't, if they vote against this, and it doesn't pass, and there is another QUT case or another bill leak case, that will be on their conscience. It will be their fault. Um, this is an opportunity mm. to ensure there are no more travesties of justice like that. And personally, I wouldn't want that on my conscience, and I'm sure they're the same. All right, we appreciate your time. Uh, Senator James Patterson, thanks so much for joining us on Newsday. Thank you, Peter. Cheers.